And what I want to do is to kind of give you a, a brief summary of where I think we are, the negotiations, to let you know what, I think everybody can hear me, I don't think a bullhorn in here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then after, you know, if people have questions, you know, I'll be glad to try and answer you know, whatever questions I can. So, just, you know, most recently, uh, in, after the uh, CERB hearing uh, on Sunday, Marty and I met with Doug Fecker, who's chair of the board, uh, Cheryl Schrader was there, Marty can tell me if you, uh, I don't remember who else, um, and who was, it? oh yeah, Gutman, right, oh yeah, that was it, right, how could I forget, uh, Dan Gutman, and this meeting was facilitated uh, by the Chancellor's Office and the General Counsel of the uh, Chancellor of the Ohio Department of Education just sat in on the meeting, was not a participant in it, but just to help, you know, I guess basically both parties get together. And our purpose at that meeting was not to directly negotiate, but to try and set a framework in other words, to be able to talk about the issues and kind of see where we were on these things to help develop, to give, I think, some guidance maybe to each side about what they could actually put forward and some concrete proposals that might try and resolve the differences that we had. And so, you know, we of course talked about all of the major issues there uh, and we of course made clear you know that certainly workload uh, you know was extraordinarily important to us um, we also said at the same time that we have been saying all along that we will not give up the right to negotiate about health care and that what we were interested in was laying out the possibility of having a contract, really two contracts. One that would start immediately upon agreement and go through 2020, which is you know the expiration that we had uh, negotiated with uh, the university before and, and that's in the imposed agreement right now and then a second contract that would start in 2020 and run to 2023 and we thought that what that would allow us to do and this proposal basically actually goes all the way back to the meetings that Marty <coughs> Tom Rooney and Gretchen McNamara had with uh, Schrader. I think it was Trader Fecker and Moore, CD Moore and Tom Trader and 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 Trader, right? Uh, and, and these were again some discussions to try and see how we might, you know, get to a deal that we could all live with. And so, you know, going back to that, the idea behind this, and and we said is that we would be willing to make some permanent concessions, in other words, there are permanent cuts we're going to take, a series of uh, temporary cuts, if you want to put it that way, that would, uh, in other words, they would not be permanent, but and that that would help the university financially, and that in exchange, they would drop some of the demands that they were basically all of the demands that they were making in things that were really non-economic where in a sense from their perspective they viewed this whole crisis as an opportunity basically to try and in my opinion destroy our contract 
and cripple the union. I mean, that, that's what this is really about at this point. And that if they would, you know, more or less give up on that, we would help them financially. And that by the end of the second contract, there would be some raises uh, because, uh, to, you know, in a sense, offset some of the givebacks that we had made to try and help the university move forward. So this was kind of this framework that had been developed. And of course, we had some, you know, very contentious discussions about the giving up the right to health care because the university has taken this position that they need total control over the plan design and they want everybody to be on the same plans um, and you know what is plan design plan design is everything from your deductibles your co-pays the co-insurance um, urgent care, pharmacy, emergency room, everything that's listed in those little summaries that they give you is the plan design. And of course, those are things that the university has been changing, we know, uh, and, and uh, for all of the other employees. And so we, you know, made it pretty clear this was a real priority for us. And so at this meeting, after the university's team caucus, Dan Gutman came back in and threw out the idea that, well, you know, they might be willing to consider that we agree to be on the same plans as everybody else but that we could carve out two aspects of plan design as well as premiums that we would negotiate. So premiums are not part of plan design. And one of the things we had discussed with them is that you know our philosophy is you know we've always been willing to pay more in premiums to try and keep the maximum out of pocket and the deductibles down because when people are sick, they need insurance. And, you know, members can't afford to be having, you know, like $8,000 or $16,000, you know, out of pocket expenses. So, and we said, you know, we would be, we, one would be willing to add uh, premium categories at the, you know, $100,000 to 125, 125 to 150, and 150 and above. We also said, you know, that we would give, we would agree to some increases in deductibles and, co and, and uh, out of pocket maximums, but not the same level that had been, uh, you know, imposed on the rest of the staff and, and 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 so they you know that was given to us as kind of a framework then to you know maybe there's a path forward there that if we were willing to give up control over some of the major aspects of the health care plan that we could negotiate about these two things that were really important to us the deductibles and the maximum out of pocket. And so on Monday, when we actually went to the negotiating table, so that was Sunday, when Monday, when we went to the negotiating table, we brought in a whole s series of proposals, everything needed to settle the contract, every issue. We brought it in in writing. We gave, we handed them this packet. Everybody got a complete packet. This is what we need. And we went through it with them. And so it was everything from, you know, on workload. We were willing to add language to the workload. They said, well, what happens with workload if the university really gets in financial trouble again? 
And we said, well, we can't imagine how that would happen, but, <laughs> but what we are willing to do is to add language there that would say that, you know, in the event the university had to declare financial exigency, this workload language would be held in abeyance until the exigency was over. And so, you know, that was, you know, our way of, of trying to address their, what they said was a potential financial concern about the workload. Um, we also, of course, we made proposals on all these other things, whether it was, you know, like merit pay, we said we think, you know, status quo, we want the status quo. On summer, the summer language, status quo um, and that in return on this to get the summer language status quo that we would make some temporary concessions on summer pay <clears throat> and so on Monday we offered right now the summer rate is 136 per credit hour we offered them 140th per credit hour uh, for two years, for the first two years, first two summers, and then when the second three-year contract started, the language would revert back to 136. Um, and that is about each summer, about a $500,000 give for each summer. So you put two of those together, that, that's a million dollar give in two summers, is what we figured. Near as we can figure, to just be honest with you, we don't actually have any up-to-date information because when we made an information request, they still have not responded to it despite having promised they would respond to it in December. But that's our best guess. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in addition to that, um, we also talked to them, of course, about health care. And in health care, we said, we're willing to accept, you know, your premiums. Um, we said we will, based on our conversation, give you, we made some proposals on increases in deductibles and the maximum out of pocket. We also said that we would be willing to accept the spousal surcharge, but only for people whose spouses could get health insurance through another employer, which is really the sort of standard for people who have that spousal surcharge. Uh, categories that we had and figured that that would give them on the one hand an additional hundred and forty thousand dollars from us in premiums and at the same time we lowered the premium not a lot but some for the very lowest paid faculty in the bargaining unit so it was a net gain to them of 140 with a small offset to the people who earn the least amount. Um, and of course, then we also asked them for uh, back pay and uh, retroactive restoration of all benefits. Uh, and I think those are, you know, kind of the major highlights of, of what we asked for on Monday. Oh, and as part of the health, though, we said, because we're not giving up the right to bargain, the way to get us on a unified plan, this was our position on Monday, and this is important because we ended up giving this up, but our position on Monday was to get to a unified plan, we'll accept your plan design for this year, but any other changes that you want to make in plan design, you need to negotiate them with us first, and then whatever we agree to, you can give to everybody else, and we would be on a uniform plan. And, and that's, you know, that's the way it was, by the way, until very recently here at Wright State, 
uh, that's exactly what has happened, had happened uh, in the past. Uh, and the, you know, we also said that, of course, if they would apply our scale of premiums, that all of those people in the administration uh, and at WSRI, all these people with these six-figure salaries, you know, that would be additional revenue to the university as well. But of course, that's their decision. That's not something we can negotiate. But, you know, that would certainly be an opportunity for them, again, to get some uh, additional revenue. And that if for some reason we could not reach agreement, we offered to go to binding arbitration and we offered to set the timetables so that it in no way would hinder them in getting to getting their open enrollment done each year. And so we said, you know, if you don't want to make any changes, that's fine. We don't have to have a reopener, but if you want it, we'll have a reopener every year, but we're not giving up the right to negotiate. So they, you know, when we heard afterwards, they, they were willing to, you know, make some, and, and by the way, I have to say this, I actually don't really know what it is that they're willing to actually give us, so I can tell you some things, but unlike us they've never given us anything in writing and so they say one thing one day and then at the next time it's something else so the ground is seems to us at least that is kind of constantly shifting but they indicated that you know they were willing to give up on workload and that if we gave them the exigency language, they could accept that. Uh, the same thing with the, uh, the summer school uh, and also on the merit language um, as well. And, and here's something, this was another, but this was, and I'm kind of saving this because I've been dreading telling you this that you know one of the big things they had wanted all along was to really undermine the gains that we've won for the non-tenure track faculty yeah. um, and you know their original what they've imposed in the contract uh, is not only do you have to be here for at least nine years but you need to be promoted to senior lecturer, which really means in order to be on a continuing employment agreement, you need to be here 12 years. And, uh, and, and although they had talked about before, well, you know, we'll grandfather people, they didn't do that in the imposed contract. So they came back initially and said, well, we're willing to do nine years and we'll grandfather everybody. We told them, no, that, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna agree to that, not, not nine years. But when we went back in on Monday, we said, and they have to understand, you know, how big of a give this was, that we would agree if everybody who's here now is grandfathered, that we would add one year to the probationary period, essentially, to the non-tenure track faculty before we got they got on a uh, probation, uh, they, they got a continuing employment agreement. And I think that, you know, they at times seem to be willing to say, okay, they would accept that as well. And so, you know, when we got down at towards the end of the evening, we were kind of down to healthcare where they said, no, your proposal is just not acceptable to us on health care, and also, we'll give you restoration of benefits, we're not paying you for the days that you're on strike, because, and they literally said, because we want to reward the people who are scabbing uh, and, 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 and send a message that we really appreciate what they did. Uh, and, and so, you know, obviously we went, so yesterday I sent them 
a, I said, you know, we heard what you said. We want to come back. We have some ideas about how to try and, you know, break the log jam on health care. And so we wrote a proposal uh, that on health care, we would give up all of the no reopeners for five years they have total control over every aspect of the plan design with two exceptions and that is deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums and at the same time we increased the amount of dollars from just from monday that we were willing to give them on the out-of-pocket uh, expenses and on the deductibles. Also, on Monday, we offered to increase all those things over the five-year contract by the CPI for medical services. Who do you want to tell people what CPI is? What, uh, oh, your consumer price index. The, whatever the consumer price index for medical services is, if it goes up, and just to give you some idea, it's been going up in the neighborhood of a little over 3% uh, recently for medical services. So that's what we were offering them. When we came back yesterday, when I sent it to them, I sent it to them the CPI plus three, which essentially is doubling the rate of increase of the deductibles, the out-of-pocket maximums, and the premiums. And, uh, and we also dropped, and that any other aspect of plan design, they could set it. They had complete authority. What they, you know, what they wanted, whether it was pharmacy, <coughs> urgent care, emergency room, ambulance, co-pays to primary care, co-pay to specialists, so all these things. They, they would have control over it, but on these two items, that would be set by this contract. And in addition to that, we increase the give backs in summer school because their demand was, well, we want you to be at 145th for all five years, which is, I think, would we say 20%. like six, it's 20% and I think that's about $6 million. If we agreed to that, not only would we be giving them that money, oh, and by the way, they agreed to, they said, well, we'll give you these raises. <laughs> the problem of course was that the give back in summer school is actually significantly more than the raises they were going to give us. So we would have basically have paid for our own raises and taken another cut in pay. And on top of that, if that 145th was left into the contract at the end of the contract, that's your new baseline. And in the event that we would go to fact finding over a, in a subsequent contract, the fact finder would say, well, you agreed to this 145th, why should I change it? Just like when we were sitting there in Columbus and the administration said, we need to change this workload thing, the CERB board said to them, this has been in effect for 11 years. You agreed to it. Why would we change it? So they know this. So when we went back, when I wrote this yesterday though, we offered them more money. We went from 140th to 142nd. Remember, they want 145th. We went to 142nd for two summers and then a 40th for the third summer. And we said to them, you know, we still want restoration of benefits retroactively, and we want pay for the time people have been on strike, because you are all going to be expected to make up the work. We need to be able to say to students, 
you can get three credits, four credits, five credits, whatever it is that you're teaching for the courses that you're taking. And it will be up to us somehow to figure out, maybe in along with the administration, uh, how we're gonna do that. But if you have to do the work, they should pay you for it. So we told them that we think you know, we've made additional concessions just from when we were at the table. We've responded to you and met you more than halfway in giving you control over the medical care. We've given you more temporary concessions in the form of more relief in the summer. And they wrote back to us saying that without any specifics, having never made any written proposals, that we were being accused of regressive bargaining and that we had gone back on <laughs> what we had told them the night before uh, and that we had, I mean, there were all kinds of accusations in there, but no, there was not one, they didn't refer to one specific detail of the offer that we had made to them. And frankly, when we did it, they said, you've gone backwards on this. And I said, our proposals, both nights, we use track changes in them. <laughs> and either the language is identical, except we put a new date on the top, I don't know, is that going backwards when you change the date? To, to, to a new I think that's going forward, right? <laughs> Their wow. time can't go back. Um, and, and then we made additional concessions. We increased what we were giving you on deductibles. We increased what we were gonna give you on, on out-of-pocket maximums. We increased the rate at which premiums out-of-pocket maximums and deductibles would increase probably by double what we had offered them the night before. We increased what we were giving them on summer school. To be honest with you, and I'm, as your chief negotiator, I'm like ashamed to say, I cannot with any reasonable degree of certainty tell you exactly what this cost because they refuse to give us the information that we need to make those calculations. But near as I can tell, what we are giving them over five years is about $9,000 per person over five years. Multiply that by 560 and you're gonna get the approximate give backs financially that we are willing to give to them. And they're saying, you know, this is all about our financial troubles. So to be honest with you, you know, I don't really know exactly where we are. I responded as quickly as I could to the email that we got from Larry Chain. Um, and uh, maybe this was a mistake. I'm going to say this anyway. You know, he said he writes to me and he says, Rudy, like he's my buddy. <laughs> so I started off and I referred, I call him Mr. Chan. When I write to him, I call him Mr. Chan. And I said to him, in the future, I'll appreciate it if you will address me as Dr. Fichtenbaum. Yes. <laughs> because my friends and my colleagues call me Rudy, and you are neither. <laughs> but I said to him, I do not understand how you believe this is regressive. And I went through, point by point, everything that I have explained to you. And I wrote it all down, article by article, where we had given more, and in no place had we gone back. They don't have anything in writing. They haven't offered anything. So they can say, well, we never offered you this, or we never offered you that and we don't really know. 
Don't and, put anything in writing ever again. <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty hard, to be honest with you, to negotiate when you are not in writing. And I think, look, you know, they can do that, but, you know, we have to take the high road. Yep. And absolutely. This is showing we want a deal. If yeah. we didn't want a deal, yeah. we'd be doing what they're doing yeah. and yeah. not putting it in writing. But we put it in writing because once we put it in writing, we are not going back. Right. We do not engage in regressive bargaining. They've right. been regressive bargaining yeah. since March of 2017 right. when they walked away from the table. They engaged in regressive bargaining at fact-finding when they brought in one proposal and they said, oh, you don't like that? We'll make it worse. Mm -hmm. And that's what our attorney said. Our attorney said it was worse. So at this point, I honestly don't know, you know what to tell you. They did not say, they said, you know, we don't have anything set for any other meetings with them. They didn't say that they wouldn't meet with us. They didn't say, we will give you something in writing. They said, you know, maybe we can resume discussions. That's what they like to call them. Um, and of course, what we want are not discussions, but we want to negotiate. We want a contract. So, I think that's where we are. You know, we're still, we're gonna do, you know, the best we can. We've, we did offer to them that, you know, if getting some more money in one place rather than in another was important to them, you know, we could consider that, but we really didn't see that there was much more room to give financially because we're, you know, there's not much left. You know, the cookie jar is empty here. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, we're hoping that, I think that, you know, if we stay strong, if we all stay together, and we know they're not teaching the classes, and we know it because they admitted it at the CERB hearing, and I know all of you know that. But, you know, you got to get the word out to your colleagues that, you know, it turns out that we are important after all. In spite of the fact that you are only one-sixth of the employees, a mere one-sixth, it turns out that you're a pretty special one-sixth because the faculty are the heart and soul of any university. <laughs> Universities are about two groups of people. The students, and they're number one, and the faculty who teach them. That's what it's about. It's the faculty who bring in all the revenue through the tuition and the grants. Nobody else. All the other people are living off of the revenue that we generate, that the faculty generate. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. <laughs>